Okay, we're live now. Um, let me just check and make sure that everybody can see us. Frank Wolf, your resigner. Frank uh, Wolf decided not to run next term. Um, just one second. Have you heard that uh, Frank Wolf has decided not to run for next term? Oh, really? Um, yeah. I thought he is already, he reached the retirement. Retirement yeah. age. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, um, welcome. Uh, we're we're broadcasting live now, and uh, we're very sorry for the slight delay. Um, we're always experimenting with new technology, and uh, sometimes it takes us uh, a while to get to grips with it. So, um, welcome to the open news hang hangout, uh, open newsroom hangout. We're joined today by two very special guests to mark the fifth anniversary of the detention of Chinese Nobel laureate Lu Jibao and the house arrest of his wife Lu Jia, um, who has been under house arrest since her husband was awarded the uh, Nobel Peace Prize in 2010. Uh, in association with Frontline Defenders and Penn International, we're very pleased to welcome our guests. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Lao Tenshi, uh, former president of the Independent Chinese Penn Center, a human rights defender, and a columnist uh, with the literary journal, journal Samsonia Way. Uh, very welcome, uh, Lao Tenshi. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'd also like to welcome uh, Dr. Yang Jianli, who is president of Initiatives for China and a fellow at Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Yang witnessed the crackdown around Tiananmen Square in 1989 and narrowly escaped uh, China at that time. Uh, returning in 2002, he was arrested and served uh, five years in a Chinese prison before international pressure helped lead to his release. Uh, he's an active campaigner for human rights and democracy in China. Uh, welcome, um, Dr. Yang Lan Yanli. Uh, thank you, Falem. Hello, everyone. And uh, just to let people know, we're hoping to be joined um, by somebody from Frontline. So if that person appears on our screens, I'll introduce you. And uh, it'll be Andrew Anderson, uh, Deputy Director at Frontline, uh, or Adam Shapiro, who is their uh, head of campaigns. And uh, just to a note that um, Frontline Defenders is an international foundation for the protection of human rights defenders. Um, so we're very, very pleased to have our guests here today. Uh, if I could start maybe uh, with Lao Ten Shi, um, how would you sum up um, how would you sum up uh, Liu Xiaobao and his work? Well, today everyone knows the name Liu Xiaobo, and the association is um, an empty chair because Liu Xiaobo has received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2010, and he was at that time in uh, December 10th, uh, he was in prison and he was not, of course, not allowed to come to Oslo to accept uh, the high honor and not his family member and no other Chinese colleagues or friends are allowed to leave the country at that time. Uh, but if you want me to just sum up a little bit about uh, Liu Xiaobo's life and work, I would uh, say um, that uh, maybe I, I can I can put it in that way uh, a very good friend of Liu Xiaobo a, a very famous young writer his name is Yu Jie has recently or shall we say about a year ago has published an autobiography 
biography of Liu Xiaobo. And I think he has done a very good job. He has uh, uh, divided Liu Xiaobo's life in three different periods. Uh, maybe I can just, just repeat. He's, I think this is a very reasonable way to uh, divide uh, Liu Xiaobo's life. The first period is before 1989. Um, well, uh, in the 80s, Liu Xiaobo was a young poet, a scholar, and uh, uh, literature critic, and he has um, written lots of critical articles to criticize the traditional Chinese literature and Chinese philosophy. And uh, he was a brilliant uh, young scholar. And at that time, he has won the name a black horse. You know, it's just um, before that, uh, he, 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 he was not quite well known. Liu Xiaobo was born in 1955, so at that time he was about uh, uh, in, at the end of 20. And uh, it was a very creative period of his life. The second part, maybe I can say, is after 1989, uh, after the Tiananmen <coughs> Massacre, as we all know, he was very deeply involved in that uh, democratic movement and has played a very important role in organizing the student and also at the end phase of the movement, he tried to save the life of the, the students. Well, maybe some are not very uh, satisfied with his role because he did make some mistake. I don't want to go to the details. Um, and then after that, Liu Xiaobo, in the 90s, Liu Xiaobo was in prison several times. The longest time was uh, from 96 to 99. He has been sent to Laojiao, re-education through labor camps. And uh, so that was the, in, in that part of time, that 10 years, he has written quite a uh, lot of articles, but he also tried to, um, how do you say, to rethink about the democratic movement in 89. Well, now I move to the third period. That's uh, in this, uh, in the 21st century, the last 10 years, from 2000 to 2000 to 2008 to his arrest. This was a very, very creative um, uh, years. He has written more than 800 articles, and each article has very deep thoughts, and his, uh, his thoughts about politics, about the social happenings, and, uh, and literature, and so on. Till his arrest, he was a very he becomes really, his character becomes more mature, his thoughts becomes settled down, and he becomes humble. He learns a lot through the past different uh, <clears throat> movement and activities. And to his arrest 2008, we all know that uh, he came to prison because of, uh, he is one of the main uh, drafter of the Charter 08. Um, so I think Liu Xiaobo is a good thinker, a good writer, and a good activist. And he is also, I think you can say he is the spiritual leader of the Chinese intellectuals and also of the normal people. Thank you very much for, for that great introduction um, from Lao Ten Shi. Um, I'd like to welcome Andrew Anderson, uh, who's Deputy mm -hmm. Director at Frontline, who's just joined the call. And uh, Frontline, as I said, is the International Foundation for the Protection of Human Rights Defenders. Um, I suppose I'd like to, we'll give Andrew a, a, a minute to, to, to settle. Thank and you. Uh, <laughs> uh, my next question is uh, for Dr. Yang Jianli. Uh, what I would like to know really is, um, why is uh, Lu Xiaobo such an important figure as a human rights defender in China? Yeah, uh, my friend Chen Qi just described Lu Xiaobo's life up to today. And from that you know 
he has been um, uh, very active in the past three decades in the movement of human rights and democracy in China and play a very significant leadership role in all this. And he probably is one very few who, rem who insist staying in China without leaving uh, the country. Um, continued his fight for many decades. And uh, in China, uh, we have seen so many protests every day. Um, uh, 500 protests that, um, every day, that means uh, two or three minutes, there is another one. Um, but um, to change the political system, we need a viable democracy movement. So there is a process that we have to take to transform the separate protesting into viable democracy movement. And, you know, the, the, the critical moment for that to happen is that the idealists like Liu Xiaobo join force with the grassroots movement. That's something the government is afraid of most. And Liu Xiaobo represents the democratic value, the human rights value, and, the uh, and also the movement itself. It represents the political future. So that's the, why the Chinese government is so afraid of him. And so far, he probably is the only one who uh, is recognized as the leader for the democracy movement, both at home and overseas. So that's his significance. Uh, you know, Liu Xiaobo is not a personal case. Uh, you know, it, it, Liu Xiaobo become a symbolism simply because of such a symbolism. Our work to to you know to fight for his uh, release, for his freedom, is not only for himself. Actually, we are working for the democratization in China. I think the release of Liu Xiaobo will mark the critical time that the Chinese politics will open up and he will represent the moment when he is released. So all we do have such um, uh, significance and uh, Liu Xiaobo, I believe, after so many years in prison, reflecting, rethinking um, the strategies and, uh, you know, democratic values and uh, China's situation will emerge even stronger leader whole movement. So this is our hope and uh, his friend and colleagues uh, both at home and in, in the rest of the world are working for that day. Um, thank you so much um, for, for, for that introduction as well, uh, Dr. Yang Jian Li. Um, if I could turn to Andrew. Um, Andrew, uh, what I'd like to ask is um, can you give us an idea of why winning the Nobel Peace, Pri Peace Prize uh, was such was perceived as such a threat to the to the uh, Chinese government or the um, uh, and the authorities in China? What was what was it about that moment that uh, that um, ca caused such a reaction? Well, I, I think the the strategy of the Chinese government is to try and repress independent voices, people who are speaking out for human rights and democracy and when those people who are speaking out for human rights and democracy are uh, given international recognition, uh, the Chinese authorities perceive that as an additional risk that in some ways their message is getting out to more people. But really the reaction of the Chinese government um, to the to the announcement of the Nobel Prize is a sign of weakness rather than strength. If the Chinese government, with all the power um, at its disposal, needs to mobilize so much resources and put up with so much opprobrium because of its uh, fear uh, of this man who's speaking out for human rights and democracy. Um, then it's a sign that they are they lack confidence um, in their own situation. We we our slogan at Frontline Defenders is protect one empower a thousand, and we believe that those human rights defenders who have the courage to speak out 
to speak truth to power, to continue to speak out in favour of human rights in the face of repression are those who are an inspiration to others and when they uh, are able to remain steadfast in the struggle for human rights that inspires many thousands of other people uh, to push for change and um, our friends have spoken about how Liu Xiaobo is an inspiration for many people in China I think he's now an inspiration for many people around the world uh, we made uh, a documentary an animated documentary after he was awarded the Peace Prize uh, using some of the words um, from his statement um, when he was convicted and that uh, some of the sentiments expressed in that speech uh, are reflected in that uh, that video which we titled No Enemies because he spoke about how uh, the Chinese authorities were not his enemies, the people who were prosecuting him were not his enemies, his vision was of peaceful change to a country where human rights were respected and democracy was achieved in China um, and if people are interested to have a look on that, that's at our at the website we set up specifically for our work on Liu Xiaobo's case, which is called lighthonestyhrd.org. That's great. Thank you so much. We'd uh, we'd love to we'd love to show that on on the hangout, um, and but uh, we've shared it on the event page, <laughs> and right. uh, it's it's an absolutely beautiful uh, speech. It's a beautiful sentiment. And uh, the animation uh, is is quite something as well. I would urge everybody to to uh, take a look at that and have a moment of, of reflection. Um, I suppose my next question uh, would be um, again. We'll we'll return to Lao Ten Shi. Um, can you tell us um, has the awarding of the Nobel Prize um, to Liu Xiaobo uh, has this helped um, human rights defenders in China? Yes, uh, my answer is definitely yes. Uh, as Jenny has already mentioned, um, this uh, this really high honor has uh, encouraged the 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 Chinese people, and he it has unified the grassroots movement in China. This is one on the one on the one hand. Uh, normal people, young people, students, and, uh, and nowadays, I mean, uh, even, even the peasants on the, on the countryside, they use, uh, they have access to internet, they know how to use the social media, and so the fact that Liu Xiaobo, he, ha he has been described by the authority as a criminal, but he has won international uh, in the Chinese eyes is one of the highest honor. Uh, this this com this so-called conflict uh, shows uh, to the normal people that Liu Xiaobo is a respected person internationally. This is one thing. The other thing is the Chinese intellectuals, especially those who cares for the future for the democratic future of China, of the country, um, they got such an, an encouragement that they know they are not fight alone. And this is a prize for Liu Xiaobo. But as Liu Xiaobo self said, this honor or this award is for the dead in June 4th. You know, for Liu Xiaobo and for lots of us in our generation or the next generation, June 4th, the massacre in Beijing is an everlasting pain and shame for the Chinese people because this crime has been committed in front, in front of the whole world. But till now, the government um, does not uh, show any regret or does not show all the documentary what really happened, how many people died on the place, on the on the, the Tiananmen Square, how many people died in the surrounding, uh, in the <clears throat> suburb of uh, Beijing, and so on. All this, it is an open secret. Everybody knows it's a, it's a massacre, but the government did not uh, 
show any regret. And uh, but with Liu Xiaobo's word, this price is for the debt in June fourth. It means uh, for for us Chinese, we we will never forget this massacre. We will fight so long as as long as the the facts are not uh, uh, publicly uh, known or or uh, ex explained to the to to the world, and uh, so Liu Xiaobo's uh, winning of the prize, I think, has reunified different forces in the Chinese society, not only the intellectuals or students or educated people, but also people whose, whose basic rights have been deprived by the government or by the authority. So, and Liu Xiaobo has once said, and I don't remember which year he has written that article, maybe in 2004 or 2005, he said, internet is the gift which God has given it to the Chinese people. Of course, it's not a gift uh, only to the Chinese people, but to all the normal, normal people in the world. And I think, um, uh, well, this, this new social media and the internet, electronic media uh, devices, is really make it possible for people to get more uncensored information and uh, and uh, one of the most exciting things is this Liu Xiaobo is the Nobel Peace Prize winner. And that is always uh, a comfort and encouragement for all the Chinese. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. And I, I think it's amazing that we can have this conversation today. Um, and. Uh, you know, not just the technology, but all the people who, who helped organize it from Frontline Defenders and and Penn International as well. If I could, if I could move back to uh, to um, Andrew, um, could you give us an idea, Andrew, of um, why Liu Xiaobo was a, a figure in particular who galvanized so much international support? Well, I think he's become symbolic because he was one of those who continued to speak out uh, in spite of the risks that he knew he faced. Um, human rights defenders in China know if they speak out for human rights and democracy that they're going to face repression. There are many hundreds and thousands uh, of human rights activists, people who've been speaking out on, on cases at a local level as well as those who've been speaking out at a more national level who faced repression, who face losing their jobs, who face uh, being detained, being tortured, being sentenced after unfair trials to long prison sentences. Many of them, including Liu Xiaobo, also see uh, repressive uh, measures taken against their families uh, and family members as well as what's visited upon themselves. But in spite of knowing all of that, Liu Xiaobo continued uh, to stand up and speak out for basic peaceful change for human rights and for democracy in China. And I think it's that um, consistency, that integrity in the face of repression and the way that he's able to use words, as, as I mentioned before in terms of his speech, to demonstrate a kind of peaceful commitment and that his value is about, his struggle is about human values. It's not about political systems or, or about uh, who's on top. It's about respect for for the individual and for uh, human dignity in China for all people. Uh, that's that's part of the message that he has as well as the integrity with which he continues to put that message forward. Uh, and I think that's why he's such a, a an inspiring figure for people in China and around the world. And then of course the fact of winning the Nobel Prize adds um, to the communication of that uh, broader audience. Which, Thanks very uh, much. And Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. No, go ahead. No, and I, and I think you know when you look at the the campaign that's been organised around the world, we've joined with Penn International and others. There have been a huge number of other Nobel Prize winners, those who've won the the Nobel Peace Prize, and, but also 
some of those who've won the Nobel Prize for Literature and, and other Nobel Prizes who've joined um, the campaign to call for the release of Liu Xiaobo and it's because partly of the, the, the crass uh, reaction from the side of the Chinese authorities not only in, in the detention of Liu Xiaobo but the, the repressive acts they took to, to against his family members and to try and silence other Chinese human rights defenders around the time of the announcement of the Nobel Prize and if you look also at the pressure they tried to apply to other governments to stop them sending people to attend the ceremony etc. That has has done the exact opposite of what the Chinese authorities were presumably seeking to achieve. It has uh, given increased attention to uh, Liu Xiaobo and his message in terms of human rights and it puts into stark contrast his peaceful struggle for human rights and democracy in China with the kind of brutal and repressive reaction of the Chinese authorities. Thanks very much Andrew and uh, um, my apologies for, for, for interrupting. Um, no, no. <laughs> um, if, if, I could, if I could turn now um, to, um, to uh, uh, Yang Jianli, Dr. Yang Jianli, um, you've, you've experienced uh, this sort of repression against human rights defenders firsthand. Um, can you perhaps say a little bit about your experience and also about the role of international pressure um, in helping to lift those kind of sanctions against individuals? Yep. Um, I was in prison for five years. During this um, five years, uh, there was a point support from the community. Uh, it worked uh, in my case. And I think, I believe it worked um, for other cases as well. But it, it all depends on uh, how strong the commitment the international community has. Uh, just uh, um, my, for my case, um, you know, oh, based on my case, I learned that uh, grassroots uh, support is very important. It is important to generate the publicity to generate uh, a pressure not only on the Chinese government but also on the democratic democratic government around the world so that you know these these government will have a highest level engagement with uh, uh, Chinese authorities for the freedom of the prisoners of conscience in my case um, a lot of rights groups including um, Amnesty International uh, Freedom Now and Human Rights Watch even the Harvard community, um, UC Berkeley community, uh, and all the rights groups, Chinese rights groups, all work on my behalf. And my family lobbied all the way to uh, the highest level of U.S. government because my family members are U.S. citizens. The uh, uh, um, President Bush used my case to his Chinese counterpart three times. Um, so did uh, Secretary Colin Paul once, and Secretary Rice of State three times. And it, it took the U.S. ambassador to China to raise my case more than 60 times. Such a high level engagement really worked in my case. So I, I was sentenced to five years, which came as a surprise to everybody because um, Everyone was expecting me to be sentenced to more than 10 years, 15 years, something like that. So with such international pressure, so this gave me a light, relatively light, lighter sentence to begin with. And during my, uh, uh, during, uh, during the time I was serving my sentence, the the international pressure continued, and continued to. To, uh, the day that I was released and uh, I released I was not allowed to return to United States so the pressure continued and the US government sent uh, when they have uh, economic and strategic dialogues with China they raised my case again so that Chinese government agreed to issue passport to me with which I could travel back to United States to have a reunion with my family so nowadays many people always doubt whether you know our work here really helped. So I my case uh, testified 
to the fact that international pressure is very important. And of course, now, um, a, based on our experience, the government um, often not um, enthusiastic about confronting uh, with China now because of uh, you know, many reasons. But still, that takes a grassroots movement to press our government to do something significant like that. So uh, we should not uh, 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 believe you know, anything work we do is meaningless. If it is meaningless, why we do it? So we have to believe what we do will have effect in China. It may not uh, happen um, in the time frame uh, uh, that we want it, uh, but it eventually it will work. So I think the, um, the family members of a prison of conscience should understand as well. Um, usually when the international community tries to do something, something in the very beginning, the Chinese government will transfer that pressure on the family members, threatening, threatening the family members, saying that, oh, all this is because of you, and you mobilize it, you have connection with these people. You have to make sure they stop these kind of actions. Usually there is a period of time which is very difficult for the family members. If the family members can survive this most difficult period, the thing will become much better and better. So that that's my experience. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think we can, you know, we can all get a much better idea from that of the importance of it and the fact that you have to keep on doing it and doing it and doing it. Um, I, I don't think anybody would have realized the, the number of representations that were made on your behalf at the highest level um, un, until, you know, un, un, until this point. Yeah, Falim, I want to add a few words, Falim. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, nowadays, Chinese government is very good at uh, talking about human rights in general terms. You know, they can talk to you about their theory and all the, these things in any kind of dialogues. So I always urge whoever engaged with the Chinese government about human rights issues got to be specific. So confront them with a specific question like, where is Liu Xia? Where, why Liu Xia is under house arrest without any charge? You just bring up this kind of specific question to confront so that we can have some effect. Otherwise, we can talk for hours about human rights in general terms with you. And sometimes the you know the the the, uh, the, the world leaders actually buy into what they say, and in, in January uh, 2011, uh, in the press conference, join the press conference uh, of President Xi Jinping, uh, not Xi Jinping, Hu Jintao at that time, and Obama. Obama, you know, came out to saying, "Oh, we understand that China is in different uh, stage of development. They have uh, their culture specific, so that things like that." It almost, you know, people almost thought that's what Hu Jintao, uh, Hu Jintao should say. So uh, don't talk about the general terms. Get to the specific questions. Do you worry sometimes that um, that we're becoming more connected and more accepting of repression? Um, now we seems to lose a lot of leverages, but it all depends on how strong your commitment is. There is a myth in the international community. Uh, the means goes like this, you know, if you take a stronger stance on human rights with China, China will be able to retaliate economically, um, you know, uh, several treaty relationship, things like that. But I always challenge uh, world leaders wherever I met them uh, by, by asking question, give me one single example that actually happened. So, when U.S. took a very strong stance on Qing Guangcheng, did a very good job to get Qing Guangcheng to the embassy, then get him to the United States. Business is still normal. Business going on, everything going on. And, you know, when we talk about Liu Xiaobo, just three days, uh, four days after Liu Xiaobo was, um, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the war ceremony took place in Oslo, Chinese, owned, Chinese government owned biggest oil company struck a, a largest uh, deal with uh, uh, 
with I don't remember the name of the oil company in Norway. But remember, just a few a few months uh, before, Chinese government lashed out, vowing to retaliate against Norway uh, through economic means. But just a four days after the war ceremony, they continued the business. So we have to understand business with foreigners not benefit, of course benefit the Chinese government. The main, primarily they benefit the indi uh, individual uh, government officials. They benefit most from the business deal. They don't want to stop it, no matter what you say. So there is a myth. We have to solve this myth to let people understand whatever you do, we you know, we ha human rights must be on our agenda, a top on our agenda in the relationship with China. The, the relationship with China cannot be normal. If their bright, it's its best, brightest prison. I mean, uh, citizens uh, remain in prison. It's not right. So. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I uh, I suppose the the. I'd like to ask um, I'd like to ask Lao Tenshi um, some questions, uh, uh, very sort of about the, the the two people at the centre of our discussion today who can't be here, um, Lu Xiaobao and his wife Lu Jia. Um, and I suppose the question I'd like to to ask is, um, you know, can can you tell us about them, um, about their uh, about who they are? Um, was was Lucia a political person? Um, you know, f can you give us a sense of 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 of, uh, of the impact this is having on on, on them? Yes. Um, well, actually, Lucia is not a political person, not at all. Lucia is an artist. She is a poet in first. Uh, first of all, and then she is a photographer, and she is also an artist. She paints, and uh, now, as we know that she uh, she has lost her freedom since the announcement of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2010. Uh, the exact date is October 18th. Uh, she lost her freedom. And she has been put very strict uh, house arrest without without charge, as it was said by TNE. And uh, well, this is the most ridiculous case in 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 in, in the history, uh, in in the law history. A person has been put under such a circumstances that she lose. She has been put under total isolation. She cannot leave her house without a company, in a company with the police. She cannot have uh, internet uh, connection. She, her handy has been taken away. She has no phone connection to anyone. And uh, the only thing what she can, she is allowed to do is to um, visit her parents once in a week and sometimes visit her elderly brother and once in a month she is allowed to visit um, her husband uh, Liu Xiaobo in prison. But for what? She is not a political person at all. She is not engaged in any political activities. So this kind of treatment is really out of out of nowhere, and it's just because she is the wife of Liu Xiaobo. And uh, if you ask me, how is their their um, her relationship to Liu Xiaobo? I can say that um, they um, well, it is very special. Uh, their marriage is under very special circumstances. Uh, Liu Xiaobo has married in the year of uh, 1983 with one of his um, college um, classmates. Uh, they are in different uh, college, but uh, they 
they know each other since years, and so they married in 1983 uh, when uh, Liu Xiaobo was in his uh, uh, middle twenties, and they have a son. And the marriage has lasted about seven years, and the divorce happened uh, in 1990. And uh, so. Liu Xiaobo, as I said before, has been sentenced to um, re-education through labor uh, from 1969 to, uh, 1996 to 1999. One year after he, he spent in the labor camp, Liu Xia, his wife now, married him. She went actually to prison and married a prisoner. So they know each other uh, since 1989, and uh, Liu Xiao was very much impressed by, because Liu Xiao Bo has really charisma. He is he is brave, he is intelligent, and he he attracts really the attention of people. He leads people, and so she was uh, uh, she was very close to him and they exchange uh, letters and they meet each other, they uh, get involved in discussion and so on. And then Liu Xiaobo was, uh, well, in labor camp and Liu Xia decided to marry him. And uh, that was 1997. And, uh, well, after their marriage, actually Liu Xia never could have uh, a kind of uh, secure feeling because the uh, uh, the police visit them regularly and actually this couple has living uh, years and years under surveillance uh, through the, the the police and but their but their relationship to each other or their love to each other is so strong it survive really everything. Um, there is one book, maybe I can show you here. Whoops. Can you see it? Oh, here. This is a poetry, poetry written before, uh, 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 written mostly during uh, Liu Xiaobo's imprisonment, uh, 96 to 99. And uh, so, their correspondence uh, is very often consists of uh, poems, and Liu Xiaobo has written many, many love poems to Liu Xia, and she um, responds to him. But mostly, he writes. Uh, he he write more. I think this is the way to survive in such a dimmy and terrible um, life in prison. So Liu Xiaobo has written lo lots of. Um, a poems to her, and I suppose nowadays she is still writing. But as we know, uh, they are not allowed to read the, the letters from from each other, and uh, so their rely their relationship is very very strong, and I think all this um, um, dismay and all this uh, terrible things what happened to Liu Xiaobo didn't tear, cannot tear them uh, apart. Uh, on the contrary, they stick it even more together. And Liu Xia will always be on the side of Liu Xiaobo. And Liu Xiaobo is always, his thoughts is always um, uh, around her. We, we know that because uh, I read most of his, uh, his love poems and I as a as a person, I am really uh, very much touched, and I think uh, this connection uh, gives Liu Xia lots of strength. We know that she is not the best health, and she suffered under depression. But uh, I think if she thinks on her hus husband, and if she reads the even the old love poems, she will get lots of strengths. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I suppose maybe the question is, you know, this, these are 
these are you know wonderful articulate people and they're very much in love and they have a lot to give you know is there a solution for them is there a place for this kind of nice people in China or outside China or you know what's the what's the what's the solution here and you know, I, I um, the solution well uh, Jenny has talked talked about uh, his experience in prison and all the international um, <clears throat> efforts to try to rescue him and there is enough uh, not enough but there's lots of uh, international effort try to um, uh, to to uh, to help Liu Xiaobo try to persuade the Chinese uh, government to release him earlier, and uh, and they are. But uh, I I want to rem remind everyone the fact since Hu Jintao came to power in 2005, he never released any political prisoner earlier. And two years ago, when Chen Guangchen left China, there, there was a deal between two governments, between uh, Obama government and Hu Jintao's government. And under, only under such circumstances, Chen Guangchen left, uh, left China. But it, it didn't mean that the Chinese government release him or to just let him, let him go. He didn't, he has, he, uh, Chen Guangchen has been in, in prison many years, four years, and uh, uh, he, he, he served a sentence. He was a free man, but they still uh, suppress him, so he escaped. So uh, it, it doesn't mean that he, he got uh, some mercy from the Chinese government, not at all, on the contrary. So we, I don't think we can expect that the new government, the Xi Jinping government, is going to release Liu Xiaobo earlier. I am very much afraid that the, Liu Xiaobo will serve the, the full sentence, only if some kind of very special situation happened. Otherwise, in the regular situation, I am afraid he will serve the whole sentence, which means this couple will be apart for that long time. And this is the this is the reality. Very cruel, but but uh, it is like that. I I'm very much uh, in a. Uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, Liu Xia knows that uh, he, her, or their friends, their colleagues, and even people they don't they don't know are supporting them, and this gives her lots of strength. And uh, there are still some way to maybe not directly, but there is way to let her know that people are behind her, and. Uh, well, who knows? Uh, you know, maybe these circumstances, as cruel as it is, it is a good time for the couple to show their artistic ability. Maybe later we will have the chance to read a really, really wonderful literature of love letters, love poems, and so on. I'm sorry to say this. I'm, I know it's cruel. It is very sad. But this is the reality at the moment. Only if some very special thing happens. Otherwise, I don't see any chance that uh, Liu Xiaobo can be released earlier. Maybe Liu Xia's situation can can improve a little bit. Maybe. Thank you so much. If I could, if I could turn to. Um, if I could turn to Dr. Uh, Yang Jian Li, you've made this kind of sacrifice for you know for for your countrymen and for your for your uh, beliefs. And um, can you tell us a, a little bit about you know uh, what that m meant for you personally? Yeah. I don't want to talk too much about myself. This is about Liu Xiaobo. I want to follow um, uh, my friend and colleague Lian Qi. Uh, she said, uh, I just want to correct her. After uh, Hu Jintao assumed the power, there was only one case that China agreed to release a prisoner earlier.
that's my case. I was offered a few times to release to uh, to be released to return to United States to have a reunion with um, my family. Uh, I turned them down. I turned them down because you know my sentence was five years. Um, when they offer the early release and just uh, you know a year about a year or one times just um, nine months eight months so I just uh, it's, it's not that important number two the early release agreement came under the condition that mm. I had to leave the country mm. right away and mm. I returned to China one of the purposes uh, was to mm. bring the issue mm. of the right to return mm. to the attention of international mm. community so I returned uh, without a legal um, travel document, and uh, so I don't want to. I did not want to leave um, uh, by force. Um, so I, I I wanted to leave China uh, as a free choice, uh, as a citizen. And if uh, as a citizen, if I choose to remain in China, I had every right to do so. So I insist not going. So one time they took me to international airport, Beijing International Airport, and went through the security check. And uh, the the U.S. first secretary, a uh, political uh, um, uh, con uh, counselor, was there waiting for me to accompany me all the way from uh, Beijing to Boston, where my home was. Uh, but I insist. Um, negotiation with Chinese authorities. The negotiation went four and four, three or four hours without any result. So they put me back to prison. I served my full sentence. So um, that that's the um, as far as I know, that was the only case that Chinese government agreed to release a prison on earlier uh, uh, schedule. Um, as I said. You know, this is about not about me, about international support. It, you know, it all depends on how strong the commitment is. In my case, it's a very, very um, 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 uh, a good example to show if the highest level of the democratic government really commits themselves for the freedoms of the political prisoners. It works. It works. So. Um, that that's why everywhere I go, I tell my story. I let them know it works for me. It works for others as well. And and Liu Xia, although she is allowed to visit to visit uh, Liu Xiaobo occasionally, she is not allowed to tell the outside world what Liu Xiaobo told her. And she is not allowed to tell us what the situation in Liu Haobo is. So Liu Haobo's prison situation actually is everybody's guess. So I agree with uh, uh, Tian Qi. We may not, we shouldn't hope that he will be released on the earlier schedule. Um, not only because of uh, of the government willing to do, you know, to do, uh, to to release the prisoners, and now, you know, uh, 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 less willing, less willing to release the uh, prisoners uh, earlier than they used to, but because Liu Xiaobo become a, such a symbolism, the freedom of Liu Xiaobo, release of Liu Xiaobo will mark the very beginning of the opening up, just like the case of Aung San Suu Kyi. Remember, in the late of 2010, the government, I mean, the Hanta government was prepared to open up. Then they released um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Without being prepared to do something significantly politically, <coughs> they would not uh, release Liu Xia, uh, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. So I think uh, uh, Liu Xiaobo's case would be similar. But that said, we should not forget that we can do something to improve his prison situation. Let him to have a quite normal life in prison. You know, being in prison can never be normal. But I want, because I've been there, I know people can live sort of a normal life to keep your 
psychological state sane, normal. So we can do everything in our power to make sure he's okay in prison, number one. Number two, Liu Xiao's situation has become the focal point of Liu Xiaobo's case. Liu Xia has been under house arrest for three, more than three years without being charged any of crimes. And he now is a suffering severe depression. So her situation needs immediate international attention. So we must take urgent and targeted action to help her. First thing she should have is to have access to independent medical doctor for a treatment, adequate treatment for her um, uh, uh, situation. And she is afraid of uh, a government assigned doctor would uh, institutionalize her situation, meaning put her into uh, uh, psychological, uh, you know, some kind of psychiatric uh, hospital and further isolated with the world. So international community to do a lot of things to make sure at least that she will receive adequate medical treatment. And the Liu Xiaobo's freedom and Liu Xiaobo's freedom is workable. And we can even, if she agrees, we can get her uh, out of China. She will continue to, uh, to fight for her husband's uh, freedom as um, uh, Natan Sharansky's wife did uh, many years ago. And uh, there's nothing we can do. And uh, of course, Liu Xiaobo is, becomes uh, the, the symbolic leader of the movement. So if the movement advances, the, the, the li uh, likelihood for Liu Xiaobo to be released will be higher. And so as a friend, as colleague, we should work hard to build a viable movement in China to force hands of the Chinese government to, to open up. If we can force hands of the Chinese government to open up before his sentence uh, 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 finished, then he will be released earlier. So there are a lot, lot of things work together for his freedom and for the opening up of China. So we, in any case, we should not just give up saying, oh, our work is meaningless, is helpless here. So we should not have such a mentality. So in any case, we have to continue our work here, both here and at home. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose to, to wrap it up, um, I think, uh, you know, every, you've been so generous with your time. We really appreciate this. Um, if we could just ask one more question, which is really, um, what areas are human rights defenders active in in China? You know, what shape is the push for human rights uh, taking? And um, what are the risks to, to those involved in it? And um, if I could start with Andrew, and then we'll, we'll, we'll do the circle again. Well, I mean, <clears throat> first of all, I, I agree very much with, with what Jian Shi and Jian Li have been saying, and that it's important to continue to try and mobilize international pressure, and that it's, it's important to try and mobilize pressure, including on the case of, of Liu Jia, because it is uh, unpardonable what the Chinese authorities are doing in terms of the prolonged isolation of her for, with no charges and and no pretense at any kind of legal process against her and no basis to take any action against her and if people would like to join uh, in our campaign you'll, they'll find the details on the website as you uh, mentioned it before um, but I think it's also true that real change inside China will come from human rights defenders inside China and the good news is that there are more human rights defenders speaking out on more issues across China than maybe there has ever been before that's provoking a backlash from the authorities and there's more uh, repression and more people being arrested and detained. One of the, the issues which the, the new leadership uh, of the Communist Party have been raising is uh, anti-corruption but when human rights defenders in China have been raising issues of corruption they have faced a fierce backlash at the local and in the national level have been uh, detained, tortured, uh, had uh, repression visited upon them. So there, there's a clear difference between what's allowed uh, when there's maneuvering going on within the leadership of the party, but when corruption is affecting ordinary people, 
they're still tra still trying to to close down debate and discussion. And we know from countries around the world that the only effective way uh, to fight corruption is to shine a spotlight on it, to encourage freedom of expression and freedom of association. And that's something that the party in China is still determined to try and resist. But the broad the broad message uh, I would want to try and emphasize is that there is a growing number of people speaking out for human rights in China, whether it's people working on, on women's rights or children's rights or the rights of uh, people with HIV, uh, or whether it's people who are, who are petitioning on individual cases, people who are working on issues related to, to land seizures um, and land expropriation, or people raising issues to do with corruption. And those are the people who are really making a difference in China. And we need from the outside world to be doing what we can to support and, and encourage uh, those people and emphasize that, that speaking out for human rights and raising human rights issues is something that's recognized in the international human rights framework. China's recently been appointed to the UN Human Rights Council and, and as was mentioned before, is happy to talk in vague terms about human rights. Well, we need to hold them to account for their human rights record and the wave of repression they're visiting and upon human rights defenders at the moment. And, it, and it's not good enough for Western governments taking this um, China's too rich for us to speak up about human rights anymore or China's too powerful for us to speak up about human rights anymore. If we believe in human rights and as an international community we've all signed up for human rights, we need to believe human rights apply to everybody and, and we're working hard to push uh, for the recognition and application of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders which guarantees rights for people to speak up and speak out about human rights critically in countries all around the world and including in uh, the United States of America or in other places and that's something we need to continue to push without fear or favor in countries around the world whether they're powerful countries or whether they're countries uh, which are seen as being less influential and, and the key is as I said already is is people working at the local uh, and national level speaking out for human rights in spite of the, the the repression they're facing we say when we're doing security training with human rights defenders that repression is a kind of feedback that it's one of the ways which those the powerful react to, to those who are speaking truth to power, who are, who are mobilizing and speaking out for human rights. And you can kind of measure the impact that people are having by the level of backlash you get from those in authority. And we're seeing a backlash uh, from the Chinese government at the moment, and that's a sign that the human rights movement is growing in China and is being more effective. And that's a good thing, and let's hope it goes forward in a positive direction. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose sa same question to um, to Lao Ten Chi, please. Um, thank you. I think the uh, Xi Jinping uh, uh, government uh, is nowadays very sophisticated. Uh, it goes in two directions. On the one hand, it re it tries to fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. which wins really the heart of the people. On the other hand, it also use or abuse the nationalism, the patriotism. For instance, the, the Chinese government declared the, uh, the air defense zone, and which really mobilized the normal people, the Chinese people said, oh, well, our, our country is strong, we, we should show our neighbor, this is our territory, this is our air territory, territory and so on. So it, this government, Xi Jinping's government, knows how to, uh, grab, uh, how to grab the, the, the feeling of the people, to win their sympathy and win their support. On the other hand, it strikes really hard uh, against the human rights defenders, the lawyers, and the bloggers, the writers, and dissidents, and so on. Uh, we know in the recent uh, months uh, there is the, <clears throat> the new citizen movement. Uh, there are a group of people who are behind this uh, really peaceful, reasonable uh, 
move, we, we call it movement. It's not a movement, but it's the effort to um, to approach more to 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 try to uh, uh, put the the government under uh, under certain direction that the society becomes more be, uh, turns to a little more to the rule of law and to protect the basic human rights of the people is called a new citizen movement. And the leader, Xu Zhiyong, has been uh, put into jail since, um, well, I, I, I don't recall, is it September or even, even earlier this year. And another, for instance, another um, blogger and industrial business, Wang Gongquan, who support this movement and support lots of um, uh, human rights defenders. He has been also arrested and the government put him under pressure so that somehow he uh, he uh, show a little bit regret and uh, maybe he will retreat from from his involvement in all this uh, this uh, citizen movement. So the government used two methods. On the one hand, very strong and uh, internationally in the international uh, politics, and on the other hand, in, to, uh, in, in the domestic policy, uh, um, in the domestic po um, politics, it tried to fight against uh, corruption, but only to a certain stand, so that it can uh, win the sympathy of the people. On the other hand, it shows the strong hand to control the, op the public opinion, to control everything public, um, <clears throat> uh, to control the freedom of the press. So I think it is very, very important nowadays if we, if we try to uh, fight for a democratic uh, future for China, we should use, everyone should uh, try from his or her uh, position uh, even if you are a peasant, if 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 you if you feel your right has been uh, uh, offended, you can stand up and and fight for your for for your rights. We know that nowadays the the mass movement in the whole country daily there are big scale of pro, pro, um, uh, protest uh, um, uh, uh, actions. In the whole in the whole country, and people, it it's sometimes it's not just I feel that my rights has been offended, but if my friends, if my neighbor, or if other people, people who, whom I don't know, I have no personal con, uh, connection, if I feel that their rights have been offended, I try to support them, and this is a new uh, sense, a new consciousness of the people and it has been spread through the new media. If someone sees something happens on the street, the police uh, just spits some, some people uh, on the street, well, I take a picture and post uh, uh, on, on online and, and then the, the, the emotion can be hit up. So every, everyone should one don't have has to be a dissident. One don't has to be a a lawyer or a scholar or a journalist. Every citizen should have the feeling we have to work together. We have to we have to uh, go after our basic human rights. If this sense can be spread uh, uh, among the people, I think. That that will be really uh, we can really uh, push this citizen movement forwards, and uh, that is the hope for a democratic future of China. Thank you very much. Um, can I uh, ask uh, Lao Tenchi um, to uh, oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Yang Jian Li um, to uh, to sum up the the, the same question on the prospects for the human rights um, struggle in China. Yeah, I uh, agree with um, uh, what Andrew and the Tianqi said, and I will not repeat. Um, what I want to focus on 
is that uh, how we transform uh, the separate protest uh, right defending movements now happening everywhere in China into a viable democratic opposition because a viable democratic opposition is one of the necessary conditions for the country to change, for the moment of transition taking place to come. And uh, the other three is robust uh, discontent with the government and the, its policies, which is existing in China. There, as I said, there are uh, 500 protests, about 500 large-scale protests happening every day. That means every three or four minutes and there is another one. So Chinese government does not lack enemies. Think of those petitioners. Think of those dissidents, Uyghurs, um, uh, Tibetans, uh, Falun Gong practitioners, Christian, Christians. So Chinese government does not lack enemies. So there is a, a general um, robust discontent with the government. Another, another condition is the crack in the leadership. So we saw the crack just a year ago with the Bo Xilai's case. And uh, uh, Bo Xilai's case, the nature of the Bo Xilai case is the crisis of the power succession. He challenged the power succession system, and uh, he failed. But somebody else will challenge uh, in years to come. So this uh, uh, system is not stable. So we will see cracks in the leadership sooner or later. And another condition is the international recognition, the moment coming, and give uh, adequate uh, support. But this is related to other three conditions. So I want to focus on the viable democratic opposition. And um, I think uh, the milestone for such uh, opposition to be formed is that appearance, uh, emergence of a group leaders or a single important leader. These group leaders of leader can represent the general public, can rep represent the people, and are trusted by the people, and can par at least partially disrupt the current political order, can catch attention and support the international community, and when the time comes, they can carry out or cut off effective negotiations with the government. So we need such group of leaders to crack open the system to really you know, embark the whole country on the road to democracy, so to begin the process. So Liu Xiaobo's significance is that we already have a first step taken. He's uh, only recognized both domestically and internationally as a leader of the movement. He is a unifying factor. So we you know what I, I'm trying to do and my colleagues trying to do to help the movement in China, to empower the citizens in China, to engage all kinds of uh, rights defending uh, activities and movement through which uh, leaders, leaders will emerge around the Liu Xiaobo, then we have a group leader just as I described. And for that matter, work for the freedom of the prisoner, political prisoners is very important. It's not only humanitarian, but also political. Because, you know, many leaders, uh, in some sense, must go to prison for training or for what kind of, uh, you know, people even say you have a higher education and uh, whatever. And when we mobilize their cases, that's the process to that to educate the general public that what they have done, what they have sacrificed for the country, for the people, and what their ideas are for the future of the country. So by doing so, we will establish their 
you know, the stature of leaders for the movement and for future China. And then number two, when we work for the freedom of prisoners and of their families, uh, we, in the process, we reduce, we help reduce the prices the prisoners and their families have to pay. When the pr price continues to reduce to the point where the general people can take the price. So the work that used to be done by heroes now can be done by not ordinary people. Then the, our cause will, you know, near uh, uh, success. So it's not humanitarian; it's also political. So I think uh, the, today's um, uh, uh, panel is very important. It is uh, just another example of international support for the prisoner in China. This is not an ordinary prisoner. He's a very significant leader for the movement. So um, he will play an important role in unifying the whole movement. The, 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 the viable democratic uh, opposition is necessary. Now we don't have it, but we are going to have it soon if we continue our work. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we, you know, we certainly uh, we appreciate the, the time that everybody has, has given us today and everybody listening. Um, this will be available, uh, this conversation will be available to, to hear on, on the YouTube channel and we'll post some links on the event page uh, that might be interesting to you as well. Uh, thanks one and all and uh, we hope to talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, Andrew. Bye. Bye, Andrew. Thank you. Good to see you. Bye, Andrew. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.